Okay, so good afternoon. I am Anto Budiarjo. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do um, every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. to try and figure out the future of uh, smart buildings. Um, panelists are listed um, on mondaylive.org. Um, quite a number of, uh, of us are traveling today, so um, we're a little light on the panelist side, but we have two great guests, so um, I'm sure it's going to make up uh, for it. Oh, sorry, I skipped past here. Um, uh, just an important reminder, the views expressed here are personal and not of any company or organization. Um, please do um, chat and uh, post your questions on the on the Zoom chat. Um, we'd like to make this as active as, as possible. And also, as a reminder, this deck, if you want any of the links on it, is uh, available on mondaylive.org. Uh, so this being October, we decided uh, to make this a, a month focus on cybersecurity, cybersecurity awareness, awareness month being what it is this month. So that's uh, this is our second show for that. Um, and today we're going to have our normal sort of chit chat a little bit. Um, and then we're going to continue talking about sort of new perspectives. Um, Lucien Niemeyer um, will uh, be focused on the sort of the building side of things. And Jim McGlone um, will have uh, some, some uh, experiences and uh, things that he's going to be sharing from an industrial perspective. So I think it's going to be a really good uh, um, um uh, conversation. But before we do that, um, hand it over to, to, to Ken. What's going on, Ken? Thank you very much, Anto. Uh, the new site is up and running, and uh, we're, we're really pleased with uh, the support we're getting from, uh, from the industry. We've had four new sponsors come on uh, for, since last week, so that's been amazing. And uh, it seems that conceptually they seem to applaud and grasp what it is we're trying to do is to try and to get a a vehicle that we can uh, get our information out to ourselves and the industry and I think there's so many changes going on uh, a little bit of my own reinvention here but what I'm finding is uh, I'm running into everybody else's reinvention as well and uh uh, our industry, like all industries, is in the midst of reinvention and uh, remote anywhere, anywhere work and radical change uh, in the evolving new economies. They all kind of cry for reinvention. And when you reach out to them, you actually find there's a lot of stuff going on. So, And the stuff is going on quickly. And uh, I think one of the formulas of the new site that stuff can be posted uh, within hours uh, is useful because uh, it needs it needs to go that fast before the monthly format uh, didn't fit the speed of the industry. Uh, we're hard at putting together our uh, AHR Expo uh, sessions uh, and appropriately named uh, Turning Chaos into Creativity. Uh, and the the assembly of the sessions is 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 quite chaotic in itself. Uh, a clamor in the last uh, moments here of everybody wanting to be part of it. So we're trying to trying to sort out what we're going to keep and what we're going to throw away. Uh, a lot of good content, uh, but it's it's going to be a, a good event, and everybody's excited to be face to face in Atlanta. Uh, I was really pleased with uh, a post. Um, you know, Tritium came on as one of our suppliers or one of our sponsors. Sorry about that, and. Uh, um, Therese made this comment that uh, she she applauded us for hosting the IoT OOT I of T convergence conversation, and I, I truly hope that the industry does use us as a vehicle to do that. Uh, and the big advantage is you get to do it in your own words, in your own pictures, and your links to your own social media. Uh, so that that works out pretty well, either as a contributing editor or as a sponsor. So anyway, very pleased with our uh, uh, progress to date. Uh, it's it's really taking off. So I'm really pleased. Thank you, industry. Back to you. Great stuff, Ken. Uh, I think everybody's looking forward to AHR, although that's still next year. <laughs> <laughs> that's coming quickly. <laughs> coming quickly. 
Um, so I, I had a couple of things. Um, I, I, I come, I, I'd look at the, this, this site, IoT Analytics, um, every now and again. And I, I found two interesting uh, pieces there. Uh, one is about IoT protocols and um, how they all come together. This is very much in line with the conversations that this group's been having in the last um, couple of months with IoT, uh, with uh, APIs last last month, and then cybersecurity. Um, it's just kind of interesting to to see their take on it. There is no one size fits all in the IoT protocol. I think we all know that. Um, and um, sort of other comments here. If if you click onto this link, you'll see this uh, rather sort of interesting diagram with a um, uh, stack sort of put on its side, um, sort of just a different depiction. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. But the the other um, piece that I felt was really interesting is is this and we looked at this um i think they do this every quarter and we looked at this i think about six months ago and i actually uh, put the full size of this graphic because it's a bit of an eye, eye chart um but it's sort of it's really interesting you need to sort of uh, think about this um uh, this graph uh, for a second the vertical axis here is so th this is the the, uh, the graph that counts the mention of specific words uh, such as layoff and recession in um, about 3000 earning calls, uh, pu obviously public company earning calls. And what they've done is they've compared this quarter with previous quarter and they they do this every quarter. So what you see up and down the, 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 the vertical axis here is how much that topic or that word um, has increased or decreased. So if it's 200%, that means it's 200% more than last quarter. Um, and and um, uh, obviously below 100% is, is uh, fading. And left to right is how many times that particular word gets mentioned in the in the in the in the uh, court, uh, quarterly in the uh, uh, earning calls so um, inflation is uh, about the same as last quarter and it's basically mentioned in almost every, or every uh, uh, earning call right which makes sense given where we are but you you see things like industry 4.0 process automation uh, software as a service edge computing they're all here as in this sort of increasing growing in importance. Um, and then we have this sort of big thing here, uh, which is obviously uh, worrying everybody in terms of the economic slowdown. So this, this interesting um, uh, chart, just to look at IoT uh, and sort of technical issues in the back, uh, with, with the backdrop of sort of e economic sort of um, uh, things that the uh, public companies are, are concerned about. So I thought I'd uh, throw this out here. Any thoughts or comments? Uh, I mean, the x-axis. Uh, what's the, what's the measure on the x-axis? The the number of mentions or the, this number of mentions. It's a it's a log scale, right? Mm -hmm. And so over here on the right hand side is one hundred percent, and uh, on the left hand side is hardly ever any mention. Okay, so so that yeah that would make sense given the the sort of the blobs that are there for like yeah. uh, economic slowdown. So who were the the three thousand people? And so do you know? Because I mean, it's unlikely lawyers and, and accountants are going to be talking about sort of so IoT and AUV, AUV and VR and process automation and industry four point zero. So these are earning calls, global companies, uh, three thousand earning calls uh, from approximately fifteen hundred global companies. I'm sorry, it's a mm -hmm. little small here. Yeah, no, I can see. So they basically what they do is they just listen in, they record the earning calls yeah. and then do some anal analytics, just pure data. To go mm. along with this is that you see where sustainability, just in general, mm. there has sort of dropped there, and where it's depicting on this. I saw something uh, over the weekend where the concern now for ec economic slowdown and uncertainty, you know, all the above uh, quadrant there. Uh, the question was asked, will that put a slowdown in the sustainability efforts that have been ramped up, you know, pretty 
aggressively. And again, the, uh, the, the, the folks were talking about the built environment. And, and in addition to you know, other areas of sustainability, so that'll be interesting to see if uh, that you know holds to fruition or not. You know, in the next several months, as we you know get into the uh, fourth quarter here and whatever. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So I thought this is interesting. You can study it at uh, at length uh, if you're interested in it. Any other thoughts? On newsworthy items, I saw I saw that uh, uh, Realcom were doing a webinar series on cybersecurity. I don't know whether anyone else picked that up, and it's it's um, talking you know about the competing priorities between IT and OT of, uh, stuff. So it might be worth a look, and I'll try and post that on afterwards. Yeah, okay. yeah, I participated in one of them, Roger. Okay. Yeah. I mean, presumably you know a little bit more about it, Steve. Yeah. Okay, so let us move on to uh, the, the topic of the month, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And uh, this is our agenda for the month. Um, so we're talking about new perspectives. I'm going to stop my share and I'm going to bring on Jim and Lucien as panelists here, if I can... Do that right and stop my share. So, um, hello, Lucian. Hello, Jim. Hey, hi, Don. Great, thank you. Hello, uh, gentlemen. That, hello. Great that uh, you can join us today. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to start with Jim. Um, if you can sort of introduce yourself, uh, I know that you have uh, your your current perspective is very much in much more from the industrial perspective. But if you can give us a bit of an introduction and your sort of perspective, of what's going on in the industrial, um, given the fact that we're trying to focus on buildings and making comparison, and then we can move on to Lucien. Sure. Um, so right up front, uh, may know me. From my past, I was actually the vice president of Tritium for a while, ran sales and a chunk of operations. Actually, I think at one time, all of operations um, for Steve. So, and Mark Petock and I worked together. And so uh, it, while, while I have a very strong industrial control system background, uh, I am not uh, without a good knowledge about building automation and even the internet of things. So does that answer what you were looking for, Anton? That's perfect. That's perfect. You know what we're talking about. <laughs> I also know how things blow up. So, <laughs> so could you give us just sort of a snapshot and your thoughts about cybersecurity right now today um, in these two areas? And perfect. Um, yeah, I just took a. I, I don't have any slides or anything. I just took a few notes real Fine. quick. So. Um, <clears throat> years ago, I was over uh, doing cybersecurity, uh, not too many years ago, um, at a refinery off the coast of Italy on this island of Sardinia. I didn't mention them, but I pointed right at them, didn't I? Uh, anyway, um, what was really interesting to me was the pretty much the complete lack of awareness of the cybersecurity problem, even in a place where virtually anything that escapes containment will either uh, cause a fire or kill you from a toxicity perspective. Uh, so it's a, <clears throat> no one's immune to the lack of, of caring, if you will, or the, the uh, ability to actually focus on it. I thought it really interesting in the, in the, in the four quarter chart you put up a few minutes ago, I had to actually look for the word cybersecurity. It was actually buried. It was on there, but it was actually really small in the bottom left quadrant. And I thought, wow, that's that's really interesting. We still don't we still don't get it, and we still don't talk about it enough, unfortunately. So what I told the refinery at the time, they asked me if I could establish a system that would make them completely protected, and they wouldn't have to worry about it. And the answer is no. Unfortunately, the answer is always no. Um, you can't. If the government's coming, if the government like the U.S. or China or Russia or somebody like that is behind an attack, the chances of them getting through one way or another is pretty much a given. Um, worst case, they're going to send 
Navy SEALs or somebody like that to get in. Uh, but I mean, in best case, they can sneak in on the wires in a lot of cases. And unfortunately, we still have firmware and stuff being built with backdoors in them. So there are a lot of challenges to the technology that we're implementing. So not a week goes by that I don't see a cybersecurity alert from something that has something to do with control systems. I'm just going to call them control systems because at the end of the day, it's it's a dedicated machine as opposed to a computer, which is designed to, to give you a lot of flexibility. It's a machine that's built to manage or control something, whether it's your heart or building or um, a refinery or some type of an automobile manufacturer or whatever, or putting food in a can. Uh, it's, it's built for a reason, and they're typically built to run for about 30 years untouched. Um, they, that is the goal, if you will, when we build this stuff is, hey, I want to put it in. I want to run it for 30 years, which means the firmware and the software and everything else gets out of date uh, in today's computer world. And that's a challenge for the industry. The other challenge is it's virtually impossible to go back and upgrade firmware and fix problems with stuff that's been running for 10, 15, 20 years. They're just not going to touch it. Um, and that drives some of the cybersecurity people crazy. Um, one of the one of the challenges that I see in the building industry is knowing where to apply your effort, where to apply your money. Um, so the challenge is actually coming up with a methodology to quantitatively calculate risk and and actually do the work, not qualitatively. Right. Everybody, everybody who's talking about cybersecurity is having a qualitative discussion. Let's put money. Let's put numbers on a piece of paper. Let's figure out what a risk really is as a challenge. Um, it, and it's, you know, I do cybersecurity assessments. It's really interesting. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, right after COVID started actually, or when we found out what it was, I actually went and did a cybersecurity project, uh, not too far from where I live up in Akron, Ohio. And, um, you know, I went in masked and we had a long discussion about protocols for being in the building and everything. But at the end of the day, I did their cybersecurity project and they literally just called me, um, Monday and said, can you come back and do it again? Now think about that. This is an industrial site, but think about an industrial customer that less than two years later, wants it assessed again. And the reason they do is things have changed. They've expanded their hardware. Um, they've expanded the control system. They've added staff to the company. And they're like, look, things change. In the process safety world, we have a management of change, not change management. From the industrial world, we call it a change management. In the process world, we have very specific terms for this, and it's called management of change. And it's very deliberately word worded like that because all change is supposed to be very carefully managed. These are people that are dealing with things that blow up. So... Um, in this particular case, this company feels that cybersecurity is a priority for them. And uh, I, I was actually very pleased to hear somebody say that to me. So a lot of times people ask me, hey, I, I was just out at Texas A&M speaking um, last week. And uh, I'm a curious guy. I'm inside of their really nice the university hotel. And I'm the guy who goes around to see if doors are locked. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be that guy, but I'm just curious. Um, I like to see what people care about and what they don't care about. And I'm always surprised at the places you can walk into, the things you can gain access to. And in buildings, especially buildings like conference centers, um, <laughs> water, wastewater facilities are probably the worst of all of them I've ever met. Uh, the ability to just walk up, open the door to a building and walk in is fascinating to me. And, and then you have gain, you have access a lot of times now to <clears throat> switch ports, to controllers, to radios, you name it, right? The other thing that I see going on in the industry is there is people are beginning to think about elevator control. Um, it's, it's dawning on them that they are, those may be hackable and they're starting to get concerned. Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing a lot is something I heard from the FBI many years ago, actually, uh, and it is a, they want um, real time analysis and surveillance of wireless protocols, uh, cell phones, um, Bluetooth, uh, any kind of industrial protocol, uh, not just Wi-Fi. What they're looking for is the word about people being able to uh, war drive, just get near and be able to find stuff and mess things up. And it's a challenge. 
so um, yeah, that's, mm. that's kind of where I'm at today. I realize that buildings are built typically by pretty close to the bottom of the lowest bidder's list. Uh, lowest, we used to call it lower. Um, so the lowest kind of bidder wins a lot of these, spending a lot of money on them is a challenge. Once they're built and done, we're trying to re recoup the investment. Uh, so the idea of planning to spend money on cybersecurity is very challenging. But it's, you know, it's either plan or plan to fail, right? So the challenge is, um, and we talked a little bit uh, about sustainability in the past. The challenge is building a very robust, sustainable system that even when you do fail, you have a recoverable system pretty quick. You really don't right. want to tell a tenant, hey, you know, we'll let you get back in the building here in a week when we figure out how to get it back up and running. You, you really want to be able to reboot the building and get it back online pretty quick. So it's um, it, that's something that I don't see. I don't see people taking that minimum step enough. And, and I think that's critical. Thank you. And as Thank a guy you, who gets attacked about, I was just going to add, as a guy who gets attacked about a thousand times a day, um, <clears throat> It's very frustrating. I had I had a barrage of attacks on Saturday where somebody was trying to attack my Apple account. And um, you know, you just gotta be you gotta be diligent. And, and the problem we have in buildings, and it's a problem that frustrated me all along, is who's responsible? Who's that person who's tagged with a job uh, and basically said that you need to keep this building control systems secure? Yeah, we, we we spend quite a bit of time talking about that on, on Monday Live. Um, so, Jim, I, I did have the pleasure of crossing over with you, I think, at Tridium at some stage in the early days. But uh, I think what worries me about this is that with the industrial world, bearing in mind a lot of the, the OT cybersecurity kind of started back in Stuxnet with Siemens S7 PLCs sort of 15 years ago, and yet you're, you're still saying that they, you know, perhaps still not taking it serious enough, you know, and I, that kind of worries me a lot. I think the vendors are. Okay. Um, I think the vendors are taking it very seriously now. And they're, I mean, they're building good control systems. They're, they've got discipline about the methodologies that they're using to do the programming and are setting up the firmware. And I think they're taking it very seriously. The problem is, is once you buy a machine and you install it and you bolt it to the floor or you buy a building or whatever it is, the amount of concern once it's operational is minimal. Um, I would even say from an engineering and maintenance perspective, a lot of times they don't want to touch anything because they're afraid they'll mess it up. Mm. And so there is yeah. just this mentality. There's a, there's a guy down in uh, Miami, Florida, uh, who runs S4, and I apologize, I forgot his name off the top of my head. S4 Dale, is Dale kind Peterson. of the industrial. Dale Peterson, thank you very much, Lucy. Um, So Dale Peterson, um, he rails about this. I, I, he just stomps his feet and jumps up and down and gets really upset that we're not doing a better job, not only from a vendor perspective, and the vendors are doing much better, but from, a, from an operator perspective, once the stuff's installed, um, people aren't taking cybersecurity seriously. And, I, you know, he's right, technically. I mean, if you look at the industry as a whole, uh, I would venture to say it's a lot like the little gray dot on the quadrant chart you put up earlier. That's about as much concern as it gets. Jim, and I think, you, okay. you know, you're right in that. Uh, that's a good point, because I saw something recently that the global spend for cybersecurity, hardware, software, and services in the smart building space it is just around $4.3 billion. And you think about it, $4.3 billion for a global portfolio of buildings, whether commercial, industrial, schools, whatever, is nothing at the end of the day when you think about it. Even though that the spend is growing double digits, 10, 12%, but that still is to your point is we as proponents of good cybersecurity posture in industrial and buildings, you know, are we even making a dent? I, that's kind of 
you know, wor it worries me. Let's just put it that way. I think we're making a dent because the amount of industrial control hacks or building hacks that actually occur, or at least to get reported um, or that we're aware of, uh, and we're usually aware of them, right? It's just like a senior just announced and websites are down. Um, it's it's hard to hide this stuff anymore. There there are people who call there are people who call me and want me to spend send out a and usually the first thing they say to me is you got to sign an NDA and agree not to tell anybody what you find. Well, that kind of goes against what the federal government really wants too. Uh, so those are always challenging to deal with. But at the end of the day, you know, the customer kind of owns the space and they own their reputation. you got to be careful what gets disclosed sometimes. But it, at the same time, we disclose because we learn from it. Right. So it's so we the amount of the amount of, <laughs> you know, if somebody loses a building, a significant building, they lose control of it and they can't use it, whatever its purpose is. For, for weeks at a time or something of that nature, um, that will make the news and everybody else turn their heads and start paying attention, I think. But it could be Lucien, uh, I'd like to bring you into the, to the conversation here, Lucien, because you're obviously seeing many of the things that Jim is saying, but you actually run an organization called Building Cybersecurity. So you're, you're, you're grabbing hold of this problem so tell us tell us a, uh, about yourself and your, yeah, your background. Uh, yeah I'm, I'm listening to the discussion and look that's exactly what we're trying to solve you know i uh so my background i'm coming from a national security angle uh you know spend most of my professional career in public service uh both in, in the air force and the united states senate and more recently i was running the largest real estate portfolio in the world the department of defense i was the assistant secretary of defense for energy insulation and environment. And I spent a lot of time with the Secretary of Defense talking about uh, security and safety in the operational technology domain. Uh, and so I've spent the last five years committed to my life to, okay, what do we do for a solution? Uh, Secretary Mattis made it very clear to me, stop talking about the problem, stop admiring it and actually come up with a solution. So that's what I've been working on ever since. Um, so uh, I, I spent a lot of time with NSA and Cybercom and ultimately realized, yes, everything that can happen to a building that we could do in a building around the world, it can happen to us. Um, and I'm not worried about nation states. I'm worried about cyber criminals, cyber terrorists, cyber cyber uh, yeah, hackers, the, the full realm of threats um, that can affect a building uh, anywhere in the world. So uh, I spent a lot of time. I formed a working group. It's great when you're an ASD. Um, you, you call people to a meeting, they show up. Um, so about, a, about a 50 companies started a working group under my direction. Um, everything from Johnson Controls, Siemens, Honeywell, Parsons, Jacobs, I mean, pretty much anything, anybody that builds anything in the built environment uh, came together starting in 2019 and looks, looked at a framework. What could we do to ultimately incentivize? I had the same problem with DoD that a lot of CEO space. I can say, yes, we need to pay for cybersecurity, particularly for OT. Um, it doesn't compete against other mission priorities. So what the work that we did within Department of Defense, we turned outward and formed a nonprofit called Building Cybersecurity in 2020. And what we thought and what we still think and what we're working hard on is that if we're going to come up with a framework, which is what we've developed, we, it has to be incentivized. And from our perspective on the commercial side, it needs to be incentivized by insurance. So one of the co-founders of our nonprofit is Aon, largest insurance broker in the world. And we, along with Aon, taking ISA 6443 as a basis, which for those of us in the industry know that's the premier OT technology standard, 62443. And we've built a performance framework around it using NIST um, in, in collaboration with the Center for Internet Security. And we've built a, a performance framework of 250 controls um, specifically for the commercial real estate industry. So you no longer have to guess of what you wanna spend money on. There is a framework and it's binned into cyber bronze, cyber silver, cyber gold, cyber platinum based on the risk that you have as a company to which the, the, the risk that the OT poses, what do you want to spend on, not just on, on capital investments, but ultimately what do you want to spend on a managed services or some other mechanism to keep you at a certain level of OT protection? So that's kind of what we, we, are, we started our first assessments. Our framework serves as both an initial assessment tool for a property owner or NASA owner to determine where they have vulnerabilities. And then we quickly flip it into, okay, and now that you have a, an assessment, would you like a certification? And then we've got, uh, a, my gosh, 
a long list of companies that want to move quickly to the certification. And that would be maintaining um, uh, both across people, processes, and technology. What do we need to do to mitigate risk in the OT uh, realm? So uh, we've done assessments already now for COPT, uh, COPT, a guy named Ken Kurtz. I'm not sure you guys may know Ken. Um, that was our first assessment. We're doing uh, a, a cyber commissioning program now for uh, car properties up in Boston. And we've also been asked by the Air Force to look at their cyber, their OT cybersecurity programs down at Tyndall, Tyndall Air Force Base, which is about four and a half billion dollars worth of new construction going down there after Hurricane Michael. So uh, we, in a short amount of time, we've taken the talk that we all like to sit around saying, yeah, we got a problem. Yes, yeah, cybersecurity is a problem. Yeah, we got to work on it. And we're actually turning it into a, a, a tool for which people can actually start using um, and, uh, and working with to ultimately get to that level of investment or that level of protection you think is appropriate for your risk. Um, we are not a compliance framework, nor do I want the federal government anywhere involved in what I'm doing. Um, we believe the industry uh, can respond quicker, particularly with changes in capabilities, changes in threats, to maintain the framework better than NIST can, better than even ISA can. Um, but the goal here is to is to grow that industry network to, uh, and truly get after what is needed today, investment wise, and where it can be incentivized by some type of insurance benefit. So I'll, I'll leave it there, open up for discussion. So Lucen, you and I have talked, Mr. Mark, you and I have talked on several occasions, and we were together out in uh, the CGNA conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, question: So, from your perspective. How has the conversation in the built environment changed in and around uh, cybersecurity? Uh, can you comment a little bit about that and the importance now of risk mitigation and safety? Yeah, so and I appreciate that, Mark. And look, we are we call ourselves building cybersecurity, but as we built this framework, we, we prioritize life safety health. So it really has turned into a cyber safety framework. I mean, that's really what, what I've seen in my time in DOD is that, yes, we've been, you know, we've been under data attack for decades. I mean, come on, you know, my mom's PC got hacked in by some Nigerian, you know, so that to me, that was a cyber attack and that happened, you know, two decades ago. So we are seeing uh, the movement of targets away from data to access. SolarWinds was predominantly a, an access attack, you know, where once you get in, you can go anywhere, which gives you a much greater capability. So we've seen move from data to access. Now we're starting to see migrate into, okay, what, what bigger threat model can I do other than I'm gonna seize your IT systems and cause you a, a disruption or seize your data. Now I can say, okay, now I'm gonna, I potentially can hurt somebody or I can create property damage. So that becomes a much more compelling case for a ransomware attack. One that will be uh, shake the, the C-suite up because they have a personal liability issue. It's not just about whether we had reasonable cybersecurity for data. Now we're potentially going to could potentially hurt somebody. So that's kind of what we're seeing emerging is that that threat signal is getting bigger. Um, and then ultimately, what can you do to encourage the mitigation of risk on the OT side at the at the edge in order to be able to prevent um, that from proliferating? Yeah, that's, uh, if I could pitch in here for a second, that, uh, so the safety function thing is actually a huge challenge. So coming from uh, spending the last eight years doing process safety stuff for refineries and chemical plants, uh, my focus has changed a little bit about cybersecurity and we do um, risk analysis to figure out how to protect what kind of preventative and then what kind of mitigative controls do we need to protect a particular um, process, if you will, or thing. Uh, and in the process of doing um, an assessment, it became very clear to me that all the methodologies that we were using to assess risk didn't work in that environment. They, they were inappropriate for uh, the 62443 method for assessing risk did not work for me. Um, and, you know, I have IT guys arguing with me about the risk of a particular firewall, but I'm going that machine right there blows up if somebody has control of it. That's a bigger risk. That we have to prevent, right? And so um, that that predicated writing the book about it. And so it's actually going to be published as part of the ISA IEC 61511 standard. Um it's coming out of the uh, working group nine in that body, um, which I'm a member of. 
And they're basically going to reference the, we call it the book, the security PHA review, which is process hazard analysis. And that actually is, a, so the reason I bring it up is because that's a very different way of looking at a cybersecurity problem. Instead of looking at it like a typical IT guy, now what we're looking at is, should the vehicle have something other than drive-by-wire technology on it so you can stop it if everything goes haywire? Kind of simple, right? We, we would think that the emergency brake would still work, that it would be mechanical, but in reality, most vehicles today have electronic emergency brakes. The signal's going out on, <clears throat> on a CAN bus type signal. So there is a point where we're going to kill ourselves and write more rules and blood because we're not thinking through some of this stuff where things can actually go really awry, which Lucent highlighted so well. So yeah. it's so, a big so deal. Look, the, the ISA framework is good for technology. It's good for looking at PLCs. It's good for assessing, okay, what do we use secure? And look, even ISA secure has struggled over the last few years for to have vendors want to get their products uh, 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 validated and certified. So the goal here with BCS is take that 6443 Put a performance framework around because that's just a technology framework. It doesn't say how you operate these controls and how you update the firmware. You know, we need to be treating a, a cell, I mean, a, a HVAC system more like a cell phone and, and, and less like an HVAC system where you don't touch it for 30 years. You need to be updated every two, two, two or three weeks like our cell phones get updated. So bottom line here is that ISA can only go so far. They realized that. They saw what we were doing within BCS on, on promoting the, how they're designed, how they're installed, how they're maintained. And they so they realize yes they have they they have limits to what they can do they need an organization like us to take six two four four three to that next step where that we are working with the same OEMs to make sure they're operated installed and maintained over the life cycle of an asset. Outstanding. Let me ask you a question. Last week we had a lot of uh, discussion around the whole OT IT divide, and it doesn't seem to make sense to have two separate you know uh, entities trying to deal with this. So you've seen now a way where you know ot and it is coming together yep so that's exactly we we started with isa um and realizing okay we it's it's a converged society uh the you know everywhere and all our critical infrastructure we're converging it and ot and so instead of trying to make something up on our own we partnered up with the center for internet security so guys like tony sager john gilligan uh, Dukes, you know, uh, Curtis Dukes. So they've brought their uh, IT framework in, which is based on NIST, you know, and, and we've been able to merge the two uh, and map them into a comprehensive uh, framework that is predominantly focused on OT and buildings, but brings in the best practices of NIST and CIS. So so your, your view is, because there's still quite a bit of debate unrelated to cybersecurity about IT and OT, about whether it should be converged, the people that say they should be separated. So from a cybersecurity perspective, Lucien, you are saying that converged network is really the only way to go or the best way it, to go? Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think, look, in, uh, in our, our cars today have 3,000 microchips. Nobody's complaining about that. Um, so it's it's converged. Data and OT are working side by side in every modern vehicle. So for us to try to separate that ain't going to happen. In a society we're moving forward, it's got to be converged. The goal is how do you create a safety framework? I mean, it's unbelievable to me that for cars today to have 3,000 microchips, there's not a dashboard light that says, hey, pull over, someone's screwing with your data. Uh, but that's ultimately what we got to do. We have to assume converged uh, IT and OT, and then we ultimately have to uh, start from that point okay, how do we build up a cyber safety framework that applies to every sector, not just commercial real estate? Our goal within BCS is we're gonna move on the water, we're gonna move on the healthcare, you know, everywhere where we see a threat growing from OT, you know, we need to have some type of standard national framework that can drive investments in the right direction. So Lucian, what you say you're obviously a strong proponent for the convergence, why? What's the advantage to the owner? If, 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 the, if the OT can be on an isolated, completely separate standalone network, uh, uh, apart from, from, the o, from the IT side, uh, why not do that? Because eventually that OT network is just as vulnerable as the IT network. I'd rather have IT specialists that understand mm -hmm. OT. They're able to connect in protections um, and, and, and monitor the network as they're creating a whole separate network that may not have the same level of monitoring. 
Um, you, you think a facility engineer, facility maintenance guy is going to know uh, networks. We need a cybersecurity engineer. You know, that's a whole other thing BCS is working on. Is we need to go back to our schools and start asking for cybersecurity engineers that are professional licensed engineers that can fill that void in the interim. You got to have somebody that has some type of understanding um, overlooking that. So you do have to bring the IT and OT guys together and, and expect to, and this, that's what our framework does is to get them to work together. I guess, Steve, the, the challenge is, is that after, even if the vendors do everything on the OT side is once they walk away from the project, you know, who the hell, you know, would know what to do or understand it, whereas the IT guys are still continually in, engaged through. Yeah, well, that's exactly why it's a performance certification that, you know, we mm -hmm. right now we're working with car properties. We're going to cyber cyber commission that building, brand new high rise in in, uh, in Boston, and then their IT team, you know, led by Alonzo Carr and you know and, and others are going to have to meet with the facility engineers and then work on that certification to keep those smart BMS um, you know protected through the life cycle of the asset for the benefit of their of their tenants. Look, if you separate IT and OT, you'll never. I mean, someone's still going to come in through OT and threaten people. You know, so so you have to you you definitely can't live with a separate separate system. And ultimately, they got to come together under unified command, control, um, and ultimately protection. So let I want to get to a direct question for both of you, kind of put you both on the spot. Is this? Uh, and we'll start with Jim, then Lucent, you go. Is do you believe today that we have? We have the right mix of technology, service, um, uh, all the stuff needed, required to make our buildings fairly cyber secured in our industrial facility. Or like everything else, our industry is full of the shiny objects and the next great thing that's coming that's not here oh let's wait what's your guys thought about that jim go first and then lose it to you yeah so um it takes a lot of uh a lot of pieces and parts to build a really secure system with the technology available today a, there is a so in the programming world, when we're building something like an operator interface, there's the concept of a single pane of glass. So what that means is I'm going to look at one screen and I'm going to be able to tell the status of my system, anything that needs my attention um, in the detail that I need. And then I could drill in further if I need to. But the reality is, is that we lack that, we lack that single pane of glass view of a lot of what's going on. Um, and I think as people become more aware, uh, as opposed to running a whole bunch of different utilities and waiting for the alarms to show up in your inbox, being able to glance at a system, pull up a screen, look at it, uh, much like you would for looking at your finances, right? For your investments and things like that. You pull that up, you expect all the information about a IRA or something of that nature or a stock market page and all the places that it's diving to get you information to explain like on TD Ameritrade or something. So if we could get that kind of view of a building and put it on an IT guy's screen, then we would be able to, I think we'd be in a lot better position. Um, I think the same thing's true about the OT space uh, from a, an industrial control perspective, as well as buildings, internet of things, how, how do you know? I mean, it's how do you know one day to the next whether you're okay or not? So it's the single pane of glass concept is a simplification. I know a lot of people argue about it and get frustrated by it. But when we look at when we look at when I look at my network security for my company, um, from the IT infrastructure for my company, I look at a single pane of glass. It's awesome. It's so much easier than driving into firewalls and driving into every bit of traffic. I want all of that done. I want packet analysis done. I want it to show up on the screen and say, hey, somebody's trying to connect to your system that's irregular and it's coming in from Bangladesh. What do you think of that? So it's so, having so, that type so, of knowledge. So, is, so your, 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 your answer really is yes, but the prop, one of the problems is the visibility of what's going on is basically what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. Um, the, 
Lucian? Yeah. So I, I've got a different way of looking at it. So BCS was specifically created to understand there's 10,000 capabilities out there, uh, you know, of which uh, any the, of the $33 trillion commercial real estate industry, they have no idea which one to buy. I mean, do you buy Dragos? Do you buy Clarity? Do you buy Tenable? Do you buy Nozomi? Do, I mean, what do we need to do to protect OT security? Um, so I think what is needed, and this is playing out with the Colonial Pipeline. You know, you got class action lawsuits that says Colonial didn't do, uh, didn't have a reasonable cybersecurity program. <laughs> what's reasonable? There is, there is no national standard. There's no understanding of what's reasonable. Um, so as we as we have more of these attacks, you're gonna, you're gonna, be, we're gonna be arguing what's reasonable to the cows come home unless we come up with a national, you know, some type of national standard of which government can do. So yes, a standard that identifies the full range of capabilities that actually adds capabilities as technologies emerge or the threat you know, becomes greater. Yes, that will drive uh, you know, a better understanding of the range of capability, uh, the range of services needed by commercial real estate. So now commercial real estate is gonna say, just get me to cyber silver. And then whoever's doing that managed service comes in with a suite of services to meet the framework and then we're go, we're a go. Um, so that's really the goal here is you you don't necessarily be picking and choosing what company because they all fill a void they all they all fill a gap but there's other gaps out there you've got to come up with a way that somebody can put together a suite of services hand it over to commercial real estate and say okay for so much a month or so much a year we're going to keep you at a certain level and we're and we're going to respond to that level when I go around the country talking to commercial real estate owners the big concern they have is well what cyber silver this year won't be with cyber silver next year's yes it needs to be a continuous validation model. And yes, you're absolutely correct, because the cyber threat is not fire. It's not electricity. It's evolving by the month. Therefore, you need to have a framework that's consistently staying on top of that. So, but you're saying, yes, we do have the assessment tools, the capabilities and everything today. But as you said, good point, it continually evolves. It changes. And what might be good for this year, you got to enhance it next year and whatever. So, yeah, but, but you need an organization paying attention to that and then packaging that up for the commercial real estate world. Mm -hmm. They could care less about cybersecurity. All they know is they've got an insurance risk. They want to mitigate the risk. They don't have to, they don't have to pay more for insurance. How do they mitigate the risk? Yeah. Lucien, you said right at the beginning of um, uh, when you start talking that you weren't concerned with state actors. You made yeah. that very... I'm is, very clear about is, that. Is, Oh, it, can you just sort of dig into that a little bit more? Because that's it was a bit of a surprise, although thinking about it, it's not. So yeah, sure thing. So in the commercial real estate world, no, they're not cared about Russia or China. I mean, yeah, they care about solar winds because solar winds potentially have an indirect impact. But right now, the commercial real estate world doesn't, you know, you know, it, it, Russia and China have bigger targets uh, than commercial real estate. Right. It's the cyber hackers. It's the cyber criminals. It's the cyber terrorists. Is those who just want to poison our water system because they want to poison it. They have no intent. So they're not a nation state. I'm more concerned about that. In addition, most nation states are operating under, under pseudo dark organizations anyway. So and, you know, Anonymous is running around the world. Who knows who's actually you know, feeding them? But, they're, but the, the idea that we're going to continue to focus on China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, you know, when, when we're seeing millions of ransomware attacks coming in from other groups, um, I, I think the, 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 the way for commercial real estate to be able to walk away from cybersecurity is that nation states don't care about us. Well, it ain't them you should be worried about. But well, do they, probably... Are there some similarities in terms of how they behave? Yeah, they're all, I mean, you can get ransomware as a service on the dark web right now. So yes, yes, a nation state can develop the software and then sell it to whatever criminal organization they want and they, they go and they proliferate it. And then it's, uh, you know, that's not, to people who are unaccustomed to that type of information, that sounds horrible, that, that kind of, that kind of stuff's available. You've got to understand though, the good guys use that knowledge too. So the oh, good yeah. guys learn from that. Why was it NSA saying and cyber cops? I'm saying it, yeah, I'm not saying it to you. I, I get, I, yeah. I understand, you know it. Um, it's, it's the common person out there that's just like, you know, like Matt White or somebody like that that's on the call. I don't know who that is, but the reality is those type of people are struggling with, you know, minute, um, what do you mean you can get that stuff? I'm going to fail. I can't possibly win if, if Russia's publishing ransomware for the world to use. But the reality is that's also what the good is learned from and, and how we learn to defend against it too. So the fact that it's, the fact that it's made public or at least pseudo public, 
Uh, I don't encourage people to go explore the dark web. That's a bad thing. Uh, and bad things can happen there. Uh, but at the same time, it is, I mean, you can go up and look at like the hackers website and you can buy utilities and tools and teach you how to crack Wi-Fi and things like that. So it's, it's bad, but at the same time, we sell tools to teach you how to, to uh, uh, pick a lock. Uh, it's a little harder to get those because we actually do have some rules about that. But the reality is mm -hmm. that just about anybody can get a lock picking set and learn how to pick a lock. Uh, but we all learn from that. If everybody knows how to pick a lock, then I'm going to build a better lock. And in reality, that's what's happened. The, the locks on our doors have gotten better because people have learned how to pick locks. Or so they just accept insurance. the risk. I mean, look, you put, in, you put a, you put a uh, Alexa in your home, you're accepting risk. I mean, this is all about risk and prioritization of risk. So part of what has to happen in commercial real estate risk, hey, do I care about ESG and social governance and stuff that may be impactful to our earth 100 years from now? Or do I care about something which is going to stop my operation dead in its tracks tomorrow? Um, so I think, you know, you, you have to raise awareness and then ultimately it becomes a risk assessment you know, across a whole range of distant risk. Okay, what's the one that's near, near and dear to my boat that's gonna cause me a problem? Yeah, I worry about, um, I worry about building automation, fire control systems, elevation control, elevators, uh, people movers, access control systems, uh, losing control of the ability to properly move the ventilation valves in a casualty, right? So now my smoke's being confined or moved to the wrong area of the building. You know, those types of things, while they seem like a nuisance and really seriously, could anybody do it? The reality is, yeah, people can do it. And there are a lot of buildings that are highly automated where you could lose control yep. and really hurt people. Yep, that's exactly oh. why. We've got Otis Elevators working with us. We've got Simplest Grinnell on fire controls. I mean, we have some of the top companies in the world who provide these products wanting to see, okay, how do, can we fit uh, what we're providing into your framework? And yeah, we've had a hundred of those meetings with all those companies. And that's what's, what's grown of that, that is a stronger framework based on their input. So based on this conversation, just right now, of what both of you are talking about, um, Gartner came out recently and said, threat actors will have weaponized operational technology environments to cause human casualties by 2025. What's your guys' thought? Do you agree with that? Uh, you want to yeah. kind of jump in there a little bit? Yeah, I joined the administration back in 2017. You know, when I got the, those orders from the Secretary of Defense, I went straight to NSA and Cybercom, and um, yeah, that's when I stopped sleeping. When because I all I, I confirmed exactly that. You know, I thought I thought riding around the world on a submarine was dangerous, but the reality is, when you shut the hatch and and you understand the risk that you've accepted, it it you know you're not dealing with people that are sneaking in on a wire when you're not looking, right? So it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge to understand the risk. Most people take it seriously. Um, do I think they'll be able to cause harm? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, and I I, I can. I'm not going to, but I could tell you the places where they could cause a great deal of harm very quickly. So guys, I mean, look, know. look, the 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 team at, at Colon the the dark side, the team that attacked Colonial, they had no idea that the billing system was attached to the meters and valves. I mean, I guarantee you, you know, they had a bad day because they never anticipated shutting down an entire pipeline in the East Coast for a week and having Navy SEALs promise to come down on their on them and their families, but. You know, I guarantee there was a wake-up call in two ways. Okay, we need to do a little more recon and making sure if we're going to do a ransomware attack, we don't actually stop a national pipeline. On the other hand, or others are thinking, wait a minute, we can stop a national pipeline? You know, we can actually potentially create a catastrophic environmental uh, situation. So, right. you know, there, you could go one of two ways where they, those who want to make a buck will figure out not to do that. And those who want to cause more damage will definitely look at that and say, hey, wait a minute, we could have gotten into the, into the smart meters and created a huge problem for the United States. Aren't the guys, aren't the guys who are doing the attacks, don't they have the upper hand? Because I guess we're coming from a defensive standpoint. If they are developing the stuff and even using AI now to develop new methods and ways of doing it, how do you actually keep ahead of the game if they are actually the ones creating newer ways or different ways of actually gaining access? From my perspective, you've got to be aggressive on what you come up with, with a, with a series of, of protections, you know, and again, how we train, how we, the people we have, 
the technologies we employ, how we use AI, how we use machine learning uh, to be able to determine uh, anomalies. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do to counter that and as well also go after them and then, you know, in whatever form as well. I mean, we went after a colonial, the team that hit colonial, we went after their crypto and got most of it back. And in the process kind of exposed them. So um, it can be a it can be a bad day. We can we can make it not in their best interest to continue to attack. Hmm. But it will happen. I guess the there are there is a um, you know, there's a cadre of people around the world that, you know, they kind of pat each other on the back when they accomplish something really evil and dastardly. And the reality is they're always looking for a way to do it. And it could be somebody, and I hate to use the cliche, but somebody sitting in somebody's basement just whacking away at stuff, accidentally finds their way into something really critical and causes something bad to happen. That, that's um, obviously scary. I think we, that's the, the view that we have. But to me, the scariest thing is the building owners. And we've heard a couple of stories on this call that don't seem to care. I mean, that's even more worrying to me because... They they can they, they they should care and they they don't because they don't under they don't understand it or what for whatever reason. Do do you share that thought that uh, the, the people that don't care are kind of part of the problem? Absolutely. So you um, people don't realize. I've walked into a ton of facilities where you walk up to the firewall or the router and and you just stand there looking at it going. Do you guys understand that the whole world is on the other side of that device? The entire world, you brought a, you brought a pipe, a wire, whatever you want to call it. You, you basically open the door and you let the entire world on the other side of that device. Now, what do you know about that device? And they just look at you and I go, it's that big a problem. If you can't keep them out, they're coming in here to cause harm, to mess up something or try to take your money. So it's, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I look, I've had a lot of discussions. I don't fault commercial real estate owners. I mean, look, they're faced with the fact they got to meet their rent rolls. They've got to, you know, they've got to stay in business. Uh, so I don't necessarily, I want to be in their office, jumping up and down saying, Hey, we got a problem. That's what CISOs and CIOs are for. I think what I want to do is offer an incentive package. Just like, you know, they wouldn't care to shovel their dry, their, their front walkway until someone sues them for, you know, for falling down in a, in a snowstorm. So bottom line is they're all about reducing liability. So if, if they, if there is a way to appeal to their bottom line, appeal to their checkbooks saying, Hey, your cyber insurance rates are going up your PNC, which is what I care about property and casually, they're going up. They're going to figure out ways to try to mitigate that risk and get that reward. So I'm not faulting anybody. I'm just saying, okay, let's, let's make it in their best interest to want to invest in this. Yeah. Agreed. Good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, Steve, I'm going to pick, pick on you. We're, we're coming up to um, a wrap here. Do you want to sort of uh, recap a bit? Um, so there's some very common themes about cybersecurity risks that uh, both Jim and Lucian have hit on. Uh, the first being that uh, cyber, cybersecurity is a journey. And uh, unlike a journey where you have a starting point and an end point, uh, there's, there's no limit to the number of stops on your journey. <laughs> so, uh, and often you have to revisit stops you already uh, had visited in the past. So that's, that's the fundamental challenge in, in addressing this risk is that it's not only multifaceted, but it's continuously evolving. So that's, that's part one. Part two is that, I, that I'm hearing from both these guys is the challenge of how do we get our commercial real estate in general, just building owners in general to take this problem seriously. And, and Lucian's approach is one of incentivizing them to take it seriously mm. because, uh, you know, beating our chest and waving flags and, and uh, highlighting breaches, let's face it, it, it has had a minimal impact. Um, you know, Mark mentioned that the spend is four and a half billion uh, for the OT industry overall always question where they come up with their statistics from, but I know in the IT industry a couple of years ago, yeah, the, the spend was in, it was north of 125 billion. So we're less than 5% of what the IT industry spends on cyber risk, okay? So that really, that doesn't tell you what the story is in terms of importance. I, I don't know what else, but because you know, the money is where people go. Um, so yeah, uh, 
it's been what my final takeaway really is the risks are absolutely real. The operational risks in terms of life safety are absolutely real. And, and we should, it's a shame we aren't taking it more seriously than we are, but I applaud everybody on the phone call today and what we're trying to do here at Monday Live to, to join in on you know Cybersecurity Month here in October <coughs> and make this a priority. Um, it's the right thing to do. And I think we should support um, you know, Lucian's organization um, uh, and, and, and point people in, uh, in his direction. That makes a lot of sense. But, um, and, and I'm glad to hear that the vendors are, are, are getting smarter. I would agree with that um, because they really have a lot to lose when the fingers start pointing. And uh, so they want to mitigate their risk. And the best thing that uh, path they can take is to be much smarter in how they design their products and protect their products. So I think, you know, all in all, it's been a very good session. We have, we've, we've, We've identified a lot of the key areas, but we haven't, of course, solved them. <laughs> so that, that challenge continues. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So uh, thanks, Lucien, and thanks, Jim. This has been a really good conversation, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have you guys back at some point. Uh, this is not going to end the conversation about cybersecurity, but we're going to continue this month on, on, this, uh, on this topic. And... Um, we will get the video of this up on YouTube by tomorrow so other people can see it. Um, but thanks uh, again to you and thanks for the audience for being here and have a great week. I right, appreciate it. Thanks all. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks, Season guys. one. Thanks, guys. Season Bye. one, Bye. chapter Bye. one. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.